many people here want their business to grow? Raise your hand. You know, I mean, it's real. Like, the, the thing I made earlier of like, you came here, what the hell are, if you don't want it to grow, you wouldn't be here. So, to me, don't do shit to check the box. Don't make yourself feel good because you came to a fucking conference in DC. Go and do something about it. This audience, I feel, it, the majority is made up of accidental business owners. Okay. So, what, what I mean by that is, these engineers, this is how I started. Engineers, we liked helping people. Yeah. And we're like, oh, we can make a bucket this? Oh, now I'm too busy, now I need a little bit of help. Yeah, it was, it was, I referenced it, especially, how old are you? What's that? How old are you? 34. Right, so a little bit before your time, but like that era when people were transitioning from dial up, like nobody knew how to use the internet and networks and Wi Fi, and there was just so much opportunity for growth of local and regional businesses, and so it makes a lot of sense. So, and, and we talk, yeah, it, absolutely. So the transition, we're, you, a, a lot of your content focused on TikTok, getting out there. I mean, I, I heard all of that in the back too. And listen, I didn't want to go to the 201 or the 301 class on it, but when I do, when I do get five or six or seven emails in the next six to 12 months from people here, that they did the link thing and it's working, the first thing I'm gonna tell them is to do it on TikTok. And it sounds super foreign, you know, most people don't realize how many 30 to 60 year olds are consuming three hours a day of TikTok, so there's that. But then two, people don't realize that if you make a TikTok that's just like a fun hack, like how to, how to attach your Wi-Fi to this, or how to protect your, like just these mundane videos that you would never think go, if you really look, and by the way, if, you know, how many people here have a TikTok? Raise your hand, like consume TikTok? Wow, way less than I thought actually. Um, so for the people in here, use hashtags of some of the words in your world and take a look. There's like a lot more how-to videos from this sector being done and there's some people, and I see some of the heads nodding of the people that are in TikTok and in this business, there's some people making paper by getting clients from TikTok. That behind the scenes stuff is crazy. It's, it's very real. It's the same old game. I don't understand how so few hands went up a, some get emotional about like the China thing, Mazel tov, live your life. B, more people just keep making the same mistake. The same people that didn't, get on, that didn't raise their hands to get on TikTok also didn't get on Facebook because they thought it was a kid thing. And everybody here knows Facebook in 15 years went from college kids to grandmas. And so these things grow, like a restaurant, like a nightclub, they mature differently. And I'm just shocked at people's audacity to think their personal opinion is a good business strategy. I'm, I'm not gonna lie, it's kind of mind bending to think of my wife's 97 year old grandpa on TikTok, but that is the same thing that happened with Facebook. You're 100% right. 100%. That's, that's bending. So what, what are you saying now? I mean, B2B, we, talk, we were talking B2B, uh, we, we've got this audience filled, and we, there's engineers, side hustles, there's lots of stuff that's going on. You talk a lot about, um, like Web 3.0, attention arbitrage. Is there, like, how, how can this audience, like, what, how can you leverage that? Like, you know, I went into enough detail in the keynote, so I'll, I'll play it a different way. You leverage it by having the humility to buy into the convo we've had this afternoon. You, you leverage it by saying, hey, this Gary guy, I don't, I don't know much about him, but, the sentences he put together for the last hour actually make some sense. It doesn't feel like pie in the sky. It feels like it's grounded in business. And maybe I should take five hours doing the research on is this real or not. I just, the thing that drives me crazy is when you're trying to provide for your family and you've made subjective opinions about things like social media marketing without actually tasting it or what really scares me in this room is the ones that did it for 5,000 bucks half pregnant, right? You did something on Facebook five years ago for 5,000 bucks and now you're like, social media doesn't work. That, that, is, that is how you take advantage of it. You make a decision that it's real and then you put in the work. First the homework and by the way, all the information to how to do all of this is on this incredible website that maybe, I know some people are taking notes, I'll let Sorry. you write down. It's all on this huge site. It's called G-O-O, 
G L E dot com. And what I mean by that is you're, you can literally be put in there and put IT service provider LinkedIn content, enter. And you'll be flabbergasted by the how to. People a lot of times with my content are like, Gary, you talk too much up here. I need more how, to, like, I need more detailed content from you. I'm like, you have Google. Like, if you need to know how to edit a video, or if you need to know how to post, like, your first LinkedIn account, or, like, if you need that, that's Google. If you need to know why you should be doing that, that's this. And the answer to why is there is no other way for everybody here to double the size of their business besides M&A other than exploding in social media content. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. It's fucking real. And like to me, you know, I was born in the Soviet Union. We immigrated here when I was very young. I lived in a studio apartment with eight family members. I watched my family live the American dream through hard work. I worked 15 hours a day when I was 14. Like literally my dad should go to jail for child labor. Like, and, and what, what gets me going in a setting like this is it's the reverse of the joke I made of like I don't care about your business, I do care. I want it for you because it's there. Like it's so much, you know like, a lot of people get complacent, they're like, you know, they're like, Gary, I don't want to put in the work for this. Like, and I'm like, okay, that's fine. I mean, live your life, but a lot of people want to grow. How, how many people here want their business to grow? Raise your hand. You know, I mean, it's real. Like, the, the thing I made earlier of like, you came here, what the hell are, if you don't want it to grow, you wouldn't be here. So, to me, don't do shit to check the box. Don't make yourself feel good because you came to a fucking conference in DC. Go and do something about it. And to me, this is so sitting there and if you're doing 800,000 a year in revenue in service local business, I know for fact, if you give me 100 hours of your time and effort on this thing, that becomes 1.6. And that, I lived what a business, I took my family business from a $3 million to a $65 million business in eight years. I know what that does for a family. I bought my car at a garage sale. My brother, who's 11 years younger, my parents bought him a Lexus. I'm pissed. <laughs> but I know what it does to a family. And so like, I'm desperate because it's literally right there. It's literally right there. Make content on LinkedIn. Make content that's not sales pitch. Make it informational. Post every day. How do I post every day, Gary? Start a fucking podcast. Interview people. You don't even have to prep. Hey John, how'd you start your bagel store? Do it. So I, 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 gotta, I gotta press into this a little bit more, but I'm gonna flip it on a different angle. Okay. So how many uh, are business owners here or own part of the business? Raise your hand. That's a lot of hands. That's wow. a lot of hands. Okay, keep those hands up if you're, you're a business owner. Hands up, let's keep, do this. Keep, I wanna see the up. data. So it, the, the question I wanna ask you, keep them raised if you are so ingrained in the day to day, you're crippled by how to grow. Of course. So glad, ready? Literally talked to my best friend Brandon Warnicky today on the helicopter ride from New York to DC, today. My best friend. We've been doing baseball card shows together since we were 14. He's been running my dad's, he was in my business when I got there in 2000. He's been running it with my dad for the last 10 years. He's my best friend. Most affected person outside of my family in the world by my propaganda and my rah-rah and everything in my soul. Believes it, like, don't even like having him as a best friend because I could literally tell him anything and he doesn't get impressed because he's watched the whole ride. It's the worst. Could tell him anything. Literally, on the fucking fl flight here, I texted him, you spend your time on dumb shit. The reason so many people raise their hand here is they spend their time on dumb shit. I'm a day-to-day, -day, right? Yeah, but I'm a day-to-day, -day so but you know how many people here have a one-hour meeting that's really seven minutes? So I'm, I'm back, uh, back in the green room with Gary before this. Before I go, I want to yeah, stay on this. You know how many people here enjoy the feeling of micromanaging? Let me say it nice and slow because it's a big one for small business owners. They enjoy the feeling of micromanaging because they get their self-esteem from mm -hmm. telling someone that works for them that they do the thing better. At what point Leave you with that one. 
I'm serious, leave with that one. You wanna fly back to wherever the fuck you're from? <laughs> Repeat what I just said to yourself, you will find a shitload more time to do things. And I wanna remind everybody, every single thing, I have 1,200 employees and every day when I brush my teeth, I look in the mirror and say, everything in your company is 100% your fault. The people in here that have 19 employees and wanna blame Sally, you fucking hired Sally. Love it. It's real shit and you could really win this game if you start understanding the truths and it's all grounded on emotional intelligence, self-awareness, what you're projecting to the world and there's so much opportunity for so much more happiness in this room, work-life balance, more money, enjoyment of what they do. Literally, you want something very tangible? Literally, on your way home, write down everything you do to the best of your ability, look at it and just don't do the three things on that list that you hate the most. Just don't do them. Like, if you have employees, delegate, call someone's bluff, randomly pick someone to do it. And if they're unable to, replace it or give it to someone else. But like, it's time for us to act. You know what scares me about conferences? People come to it and think they did something. I just don't understand why come to a conference and don't do something that you learned there, you know? Absolutely. You got started working with your dad. I got started working with my dad. Worked together for about 10 years. And you know, you, you go through the motions. There's, there's a point where you gotta break out of what you've been taught and go do it a different way. Well, I came in guns a blazing. I came in as a 15 year old who's already doing $3,000 a weekend selling baseball cards. And I walked in and after the first day on the job, driving home, we lived 45 minutes from the liquor store, I spent the entire 45 minutes telling my dad he was doing everything wrong. Unfortunately, my dad's a listen. Soviet father and he didn't yeah, take gotta, too well to that. <laughs> it, but, but you, you can I, never tell those immigrant dads Well, you know what, do I, I respect wrong. it. He came to this country with nothing and yeah. he built something real and I respect the shit out of it. But how many people here are in family businesses? Right, so I'll say there's some good amount and I know there's more that will watch a recording. For the youngsters, the number twos, not the, the second gen, too many, because of my story and, my, and over the last year, getting some popularity, I get a lot of those emails and kids are always like, my mom's not putting me on, my dad's not letting me do my thing. And I'm like, you're entitled. You're 22, you're walking into a business that's been alive for 15 years, your mom and dad have all these other employees that put the bricks down to fucking make this place and just because you won the fucking sperm game, you think you are earned something? Shut the fuck up and work for a decade. Love it. Fucking crazy. My dad doesn't listen. My dad didn't listen to a single thing I was thinking. I did shit. And when he was like, that wine isn't selling, and I, saw, and I sold all 19 cases on that Saturday as a 15 year old who looked eight, who definitely shouldn't be selling wine, Miraculously, my dad started to listen. The number one thing I ask kids is like, when they're like, my dad won't listen. I'm like, well, what have you done? Well, he won't let me do anything. I'm like, you are copping the fuck out. You You could do do a million things. Businesses are too complicated. There's too much going on. People are just entitled, period. That's the only thing I have to say. Man, I, I couldn't agree more. It was the same thing. I, I, I resonate with the story. My dad came over here with nothing. Didn't even know the language. Same. Had, had, had to figure it out in same. college. Same. Did, didn't know how to read a textbook. I get it. My dad's first words were Budweiser and Carlo Rossi. Really. And, like, and then it's tough, right? Because then I came into the business and I really transformed it. And honestly, it caused a lot of friction because I became the man. I, my dad was young, you know, at the time I was 22, my dad was 44 when I took over full operations. You know, when you're 22, you think 44 is old. I'm 46 now, I feel like a child. So my dad, to have the humility to give me free reign, I know I was ringing the register, but like, you know, family businesses are challenging. I have a lot of empathy for all the people in here, you know? I would just say, if I can give one piece of advice, this, I would, then I started a business with my brother. Vayner, the one thing I would say is somebody who's navigated two successful businesses with family, like if you're in it, I promise you, don't, you don't wanna be a family that broke up because of money. Money's poison. 
like fight for the love every day. Like the money will be there. If you're so fucking great, you'll get your money. Right? I, I was 34 when I left my dad's business. I made no money in those 12 years. I worked seven days a week, 15 hours a day. I built the business. I left with nothing. And in 12 short years, I've accomplished plenty. If you're so fucking great, you'll get yours. It's awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Dude, it's just, like, it's just crazy, because I mean, it, it, it's the, it, you're like speaking my story just on New Jersey steroids Gary <laughs> V. Like, it, I love it. I get it, I get I it. it. I love it. I love it too, it. And, I, and, and you know, we have our stories, but back to like everyone in this audience, the thing that connects this story to make it relevant for everyone is perspective. If you really ask me to like synthesize what I'm trying to accomplish here in one word, it's perspective. Can I get you to see that LinkedIn content can actually triple your business? Can I get you to see that your employees or your family not a disposable asset that you can replace? Can I get you to see? Incredible. I, so, we're, we're, you know, family business, you took it over. Now, you already talked a little bit about, you just gotta delegate. You gotta delegate. So did you come in day one, like, you're, you're now absorbing the business. Well, don't forget, I was 14 when I was working every weekend and every summer vacation. So by the time I was 22, I was like, oh gee. You know, and don't forget, before I was 14, from six to eight, six to 14, I was getting straight D's and F's but fucking dominating in lemonade and baseball cards. And so, I, listen, I struggle with using me because I've come to realize, back to making the lucky sperm club, I'm a natural business talent. It was the luck of the draw. Mom and dad had sex at the right second in Russia and I popped out. So, for me, it was the hours and the talent that put me in this crazy position, but as far as delegating, yes, from day one, I understood if I was gonna build an empire, back to everyone here who just raised their hands, if you're gonna build something big, it's not you doing everything, it's you hiring people to do things and you're in charge of the following framework. Hire fast, too many people spend too much time hiring because they think there's a perfect candidate. Hire fast, if they prove to you in the first three, six or 12 months they stink, fire faster. If they prove to you in the first three, six or 12 months they got it, promote fastest. Hmm. That last part, thank you, that last part, and listen, I grew up in a small business. I used to fight my dad to give a kid that had it a 50 cent raise as if we were fighting the Ukraine-Russia war. 50 cents an hour. He was, you know, that's that old school thing. Oh, yeah. But I'm telling you, hire faster than you've been hiring. You don't know anyway. I think my greatest superpower is emotional intelligence and intuition and I've hired so many losers, I can name 40,000, I mean, it's unbelievable how many times I've been wrong. More than anything I do in my life, more than anything I do in my life, I've been wrong in hiring. It's just a hard game. But the reason I've built massive companies is because I have fired faster in my older age because I really struggled with it in my youth, Hmm. and now I'm promoting fastest for the last decade and it's been game changing. Winners? like to be seen. And you trying to hold it off because you don't want them to think they're too big of a winner and you don't want it, like, small businesses, listen, I get it, every dollar counts. So you're like, ah, I can wait a year before I promote and the money. If you got a winner, lock it in. And when you have that good team, man, they will pay you back in in spades. And especially, I'll tell you another thing, because I worry about retention based on a lot of things I'm talking about, giving that raise and accolades to somebody 100 days in, it buys you an extra year together, even if they're not destined to be with you forever, because they really subconsciously appreciate it. Hmm. That's and that awesome. extra year is gonna matter to your business. You I compound found, that by four or five people, and you got money. I found when I finally got out of my way and stopped doing it, that's when we grew the fastest. I had to, get, I had to let keep me, working let me give myself you a, let out Let me give of the you job. a really good one for everyone. Let me and this is gonna really land with this audience. Let me teach you the power of good intent and I'm sorry. The reason so many people micromanage and don't delegate is they're concerned that it's gonna get messed up 
and they don't want to deal with the client's issues. The power of good intent, you didn't intend for it to go poorly. You've put the best people in place that you can to the best of your ability. The power of I'm sorry and I'm gonna take care of it. The power of accountability when something goes wrong is actually what you want to be doing, not trying to fix it before it happened. Gary. It's a real one for these businesses. I know this business. I know this business. I have, a, I have several friends in it. I am who I am in the public domain, which means I get ungodly amounts of content over the last 15 years from businesses in this space that are sitting in here now. And these businesses can grow a lot. These businesses can grow a lot if they can focus on what we've been talking about the last 20 minutes and my last five minutes and have a marketing plan that's contemporary. If they can grow a lot, a lot. And that's good. Yeah. So th- this season, you, you own how many businesses roughly? I own, invest in oh, 50 I mean, plus? Invest 100. What, what about that you're operating? Let's, let's, I'm let's operating VaynerX. Yeah. You want to put on the screen, I could visualize this for everyone. Yeah, it was up there a little um, bit Because I see it here, but I don't see it anywhere here. I don't know if they can get there fast enough, but there's like eight or 10 companies underneath VaynerX. I have a president for every one of those companies. I'm the active CEO of VaynerMedia, the first one under VaynerX. Empathy was a direct-to-consumer wine brand that I sold to Constellation for nine figures. Resi is a restaurant app that I know a lot of you know that I sold to Amex for nine figures. Vayner Sports is the sports agency that me and my brother AJ run. Um, then V Friends, that little cartoon in the bottom, is my Nickelodeon, Disney, Sesame Street brand in the NFT space. I start businesses as often as people here brush their teeth. I like it. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. So, so what, what are you, fo- right now? Uh, VaynerMedia Gary, VFriends. W- w- so that's your focus, that's VaynerMedia VFriends. And so what, do you, what are you spending, like in this season of life, yes. what are you spending your time on? So obviously- People. 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 So I got here. I'm sitting on this stage right this second because people are the only asset in business. So all my, all my juggernaut, billionaire, fancy friends always get mad at me when I start talking about feelings in business. Empathy, compassion, you know, and again, you heard it from me in this talk. I'm also not eighth place trophy guy. I'm just kind of, you know, using the political structure of America in a world where everyone's falling in love with being all red or all blue, I'm purple as fuck. <laughs> and so, and so I believe in kindness. I believe that nice, nice guys finish first. I believe in patience. I believe in empathy. I believe in good people skills, it matters. But I also believe in tenacity and work ethic. Like my friends that are too far to the left, like you're not gonna build a big business working nine hours a week. Sorry. You know, and so, you know, like, there's all these different traits, but I, uh, I spend my time on people. I spend my time, as you know, you even saw it in real life and then you commented on it. I'm DMing back people, I'm reading crazy. all the comments because that's how I get research. I'm meeting with clients, people, money, sales, right? I'm meeting with my employees. I, I, I would argue that I'm more in the HR department than I'm in the CEO role. I'm with my people. I'm with my people. And when you build a family, you have continuity. Ah, back to my Jets that are pissing me off. Besides the quarterback situation, one of the biggest reasons the Jets have struggled is their offensive line continues to change. If you look at football teams, a consistent offensive line is one of the great indicators to success because they have to work in such a unison with each other. I'm in the ad agency business where people's tenure is about 18 months. I have multiple dozens of employees that have worked for me for seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years. That's delivering for them not only financially, my dad always thought that money would solve it. It's not that. It's emotions, it's relationships, it's putting people into new positions that they're more interested in. It's human. And so I spend my time on people. I work 12 hours a day minimally, because I love what I do. I don't recommend that for everybody if they don't love what they're doing, because you'll burn out. But for me, it's easy. For me, working is like golfing or or traveling, it's my joy. And I, back to another joke I made, 
the one hour is a seven minute meeting. 40% of my meetings in a 12 hour day are 15 minute meetings. Think about that. And it's people and it's execution and it's, I'm trying to build a fucking empire. I have to buy the Jets and win a Super Bowl before I die. Hey, look, I, how, how are you gonna buy the, how, how are you buying the Jets? You, I'm, buy, you, I'm gonna buy the Jets because VaynerX, the holding company, and VFriends are both billion dollar companies. I'm gonna make them as big of billion dollar companies as possible. The owners of the Jets are gonna pass away at some point because they're significantly older than me. They're gonna go up for sale and I'm gonna take all my money and fucking buy it. <laughs> That's how. I was gonna make you wear either a Patriots or Dolphins jersey if you guessed the Franzia, by the way. Excuse me? <laughs> oh, God. Ugh. At Go Pats, like, watching the Watching Bill Belichick get fully exposed over the next half decade is one of the great joys of my life. <laughs> <laughs> so now, now that they're separate, you're an automatic Brady fan, right? Well, it's funny. I hated both of them so much. Like, like genuinely wash, like wished ill will for them. But now that they're separate, it, I still kind of hated them. But the way it all broke out with Brady winning that Super Bowl and the Pats, I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah. One of these two can fucking end up losing. So now I'm like not even paying attention to Tom. It's all like extreme excitement because he didn't win in Cleveland. And like, you know, if we get five or six years here of bad Patriots football, that's going to be a fun narrative. I got to end on one thing, Gary. One thing. Please. The number five. The number five. The Jets. Yeah, I mean, you know... (laughs) I know you probably saw that piece of content, so you're trying to set me up. I got choked up in a talk recently. I, uh, for the people that follow me, I always throw up the five in my photos. People are always asking why. The Jets thing. I was, uh, this is fun because it's been referenced. I was born in the Soviet Union. We were really poor. It was really hard. It was really hard. And my family was really tight, right? Immigrant shit. And we moved to a new town in New Jersey, Edison, New Jersey. And it was the 80s, it was 1980, it was August 1982, I can tell you exactly when it was. And I, you know, I was seven, and my mom's like, go outside. This is what we did, for all the youngsters under 25, 30 in here, we used to go outside, it was crazy. <laughs> so, you know, and my mom was not even, it wasn't even 80s, she was from the old country, we're like six year olds. This is real in Russia. In Russia, everyone was scared of the government, so nobody kidnapped anything about anything. So seven-year-olds used to walk 30 minutes to their grandma's house. So my mom was just like, go. So I was just always outside and I ran across these kids. They were throwing a Nerf football. They're like, what's your favorite football team? I'm like, you know, I was just getting settled into the culture. I was like, I don't know. They're like, well, we're, we're a Jets fan. And that was the 82 season and the Jets went to the AFC championship game that year. And so I was like, oh, this is good. And, uh, And literally since 1982, I have not missed a play of a New York Jets game in real time, watching or going, ever. I've not missed a single play since 1982. So it's my great escapism. When I look at people who are very deeply religious, I really understand it because no question, the Jets are my religion. That Sunday is my church, I don't miss it. I'm like an 80 year old lady in Alabama for Sunday church, you know, like I'm in. And they all had Jets jerseys. And I wanted one, I was seven. I was like, mom, I want one. We weren't spending 30, 20, $15 on a Jets t-shirt back then. That's how much we spent on food for the week. And so, unbeknownst to me, my mom stayed up late at night after she put us to bed, me and my sister, and she knitted me a Jets jersey and put the number five on it. And it is my prized possession. You know, I have it very secured. It's why the number five means a lot to me. That was my favorite number then, she put it on. That's why I do this because I want my mom to know that she's the most important person in the world to me and that every accolade, every success, everything good that will happen to me is a direct correlation to how she parented me. And, thank you. And I've got it super tucked away in a fireproof glass case because in 25 years when I buy the Jets, I'm gonna take it out of there, I'm gonna put it in the front of the stadium as soon as you walk in and I'm gonna tell the story of my family's journey and I'm gonna make people realize that you can go from not being able to even afford a jersey of your team 
to owning the whole fucking team.